So guys, real quick introduction to this video. This is me sharing a case history of my friend Janelle and her using um, water fasting to overcome endometriosis, which is a very severe uh, autoimmune condition. And this is presented in one of my classes. It's an online class where we make a presentation. So the format will be me basically showing this PowerPoint and then people will be typing in questions in a text box, which you can't see because I just want to protect everybody's identity. And it's sort of like an episode of, um, of like House ND or something like that where people try to guess the diagnosis along the way and guess what tests to perform and then guess you know what imaging to take and then guess what treatment modality to use. And so it's kind of slow moving and it's not really revealed in the beginning what the condition is, but you can kind of go through the, the, the diagnosis process and, and, and understand you know how people think. And I think you can learn a lot from that. And then not till the very end do we get into uh, what the condition actually is and, and how we treat it with water fasting and sort of drop this bomb on my fellow students about this um, amazing healing modality. And then uh, after at the end for about 10 minutes, uh, my professor kind of goes off uh, uh, sort of on an impromptu uh, chat about it and has some really interesting things to say. Um, and so, yes, the video is really long. I would say stick around for the whole thing. Put it in your watch later playlist or do something with it. You know, just put on the audio while you're making food or going for a run or something like that. Um, you can definitely learn a lot from this. So I hope you do. And if you enjoy it, you know, as always, subscribe to these videos leave a comment, like, definitely share this video, get the word out that these conditions, these autoimmune conditions that are believed to be incurable can actually uh, be reversed. So thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoy. All right, I'll get started. Okay, so today's case is a uh, patient that's presenting with headaches and abdominal pain. And we'll go into a little more of the history here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we've got a 22-year-old female who's experiencing chronic headaches, regular stomach pain and diarrhea that is worse with meals and certain foods, and uh, extremely painful menstrual cycles. And we'll get into more details on all of these. Okay, so... What other history questions do you guys want to ask? Okay, what kind of meals? Does this run in the family? Okay, good. I have answers to all these questions in the next slide. Okay. Um... Okay, so does it run in the family? No. Um, let's see. We'll go on to the next slide here. Um, so this all started about six years ago when she had a uh, salmonella infection when she was six, 16 years old and basically kind of remained sick since then, uh, having these symptoms. So um, you guys asked about what... Uh, Exacerbates the stomach pain. It's mainly meats, oily foods, and dairy products. Um, and how did they confirm the salmonella infection? Um, I don't actually know on that. Um, but uh, I don't. I don't believe they ever actually did a any sort of uh, swab or anything like that. I think that's just what a previous doctor had diagnosed. So. Um, yeah, it's possible that, that that might not have been right. Um, so we know that the uh, headaches are pulsatile and can be incapacitating, mean, meaning that basically pain relievers don't really seem to do much. Um, she can also, um, during her cycle, have incapacitating cramping episodes, or she describes them as basically... All she can do is like lie down, um, curled up in the fetal position, and again, um, uh, analgesic pain relievers don't seem to do much.
Um, so they can duration. They can be um, hours sometimes, and like she says, like she feels like they just never go away. Like they're just always on, and it's just a, different levels of um, intensity. And they can be one or both sided. Um, yeah, definitely photophobia. And um, you know, like I said, I mean, these other symptoms are, are sort of associated with the headache. Um, taking birth control pills, yes. And she was put on them to try to control the, um, the cycle-related symptoms. No, no visual disturbances that I know of. Um, numbness, tingling, dizziness, no, none of that. Okay, I see you're still typing. I'm, I'm ready to move on, but if you want to, I don't know. Okay, so we'll, we'll go into our initial diff dyes, and I have a bunch here um, because there seem to be three main problems with the headaches, the GI issues, and the, um, and the, the cycle-related issues. Any vision, ear, dental problems? No. That's a good question. Hypertension, blood pressure is normal. Vitals are all within normal limits. Um, at this point, she is not seeing a chiropractor. Was there any blood work done? Uh, we'll get to that with special studies, definitely. Okay. Urine analysis. Yes, she's been trying to take uh, anti-inflammatories, things for the pain, and it doesn't seem to work together. Um, Yes, it was fatty meals, oily meals definitely contributed to the abdominal pain. What does she do for a living? She is um, a waitress and, a, and um, does dance as a hobby. Um, stool, I believe, is normal. Age is uh, 22 at present time, 16 at as sort of the history of when it began. Uh, still has her gallbladder. Uh, family history of cancer, I don't know. Uh, feel better or, work, better or worse, usually, um, usually uh, worse after work. Timing for the stomach pain, yes. Um, after, after meals, generally like heavy meals that are like fatty or like high in meat and dairy and things like that. Yes, definitely abdominal pain. We talked about that. Does she have pain during the nighttime? Um, the headaches and the uh, menstrual pain seem to be like don't have any specific timeline. They come and go on their own with and without um, uh, uh, pills and things like that. So yes, seen a correlation with diet and pain. Um, I don't know the specifics of, of uh, which quadrant it is. Uh, I believe it's within 20 to 30 minutes after meals. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that. And for you guys who haven't taken grand rounds before, we'll go into like what, you know, initial exams are we going to do? And then we'll go into like, okay, after the results of those exams, we want to do any more exams. We want to do special studies. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, fatigue, uh, n not particularly. So um, just going through our diff dyes here, like these first few, um, bacterial infection, 
gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer. Um, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think about those? Just based on the history. Uh, abnormal steals, uh, just, just diarrhea. That's it. Okay. I'll move on here. If that's okay. Um, just shoot me back if we're, if we're moving too fast. So what, um, as far as physical exam, before we do any, um, you know, blood work or any X-rays or anything like that, what what do you guys want want done? Spine palpation, okay. Rebound tenderness. Murphy's, okay. Auscultation, where? Ocul ocular exam, okay. Abdominal auscultation. Carotid, okay. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Definitely going to require a neurological exam. Okay. Lymph nodes. Cranial nerves. Mm -hmm. Sinus exam. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into the specifics when we get into special studies, like when we're ordering an MRI or CT or an X-ray. Like where are we shooting exactly? In multiple areas, things like that. Okay, I'm gonna move on here. So just to get started, head and neck palpation. Um, vision and cranial nerves, neurological examination, all of this for mainly for the headaches, and then abdominal palpation, auscultation for uh, the, the other issues. But I think lymph nodes is a great idea. Um, you guys had a lot of good ideas that I just didn't have on here. So going right into the results here, uh, I think I already said this, vitals were within normal limits, vision and cranial nerves appear normal, neurologic test is, is good, and when we, we listen, um, uh, abdominal auscultation, we hear reduced number of bowel sounds, which I think was like 34 was the normal amount. Um, and yeah, and so finding any... Any incidents of uh, current infection or anything like that? It, 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 um, she has no current infections. Yeah, I, I don't know the number. Just on the low end, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to go into, um, we kind of knocked off a few, um, yeah, she eats regularly three meals a day. Um, and we'll talk a bit about some of the dietary changes that, that um, she has tried to implement. Um, but So our diff dyes, I kind of knocked a few off the list. We've pretty much got it... Um, dialed down to migraines as the type of headache, and we've ruled out, um, you know, any kind of ulcer or infection. And I guess we didn't do, I didn't talk about Murphy's, but that was negative, so I guess we can, um, uh, 
Um, probably, yes. Is she lactose intolerant? Um, yeah, we, we'd have to run a, a, um, a, a blood exam for that. Yep, we'll get to those. Because that will be the next slide that will sort of talk about what um, studies do we want to order. Okay. Patient might um, have migraines and over-medicate, which can cause abdominal issues, definitely. And we'll talk about um, how some of the medications she had taken had relieved some symptoms and made other ones worse and, and uh, just kind of didn't really get anywhere. Okay, so... Yes, she's um, taking medication. She's on birth control to try to um, to try to uh, um, reduce the menstrual problems and taking um, uh, uh, analgesics to to deal with the pain. Okay, gastroenterologist for colonoscopy. Yeah. So, uh, her bowel movements regular. No, they're irregular. Like she'll uh, alternate between constipation and diarrhea. How often? I, I don't know. Don't have the details on that. Does that happen naturally? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, like, it shouldn't, people should have regular bowel movements. Like, if they're experiencing that, something's wrong. Although I know a lot of people deal with that and just kind of assume it's normal. Uh, Dr. Lemke, good question. I don't know. Okay, pelvic exam, endometriosis, cyst aggravated with pressure postprandial. Okay. Good thinking. Uh, the diary is related to the meals, not the menstrual cycle. <sighs> okay, I'm going to move on here. Um, so. People have talked about throwing out all kinds of tests that they want to run so far. So uh, I think people said urinalysis, um, looking at uh, allergy tests, okay, complete blood count, blood urea nitrogen. Uh, people have said MRI. Um, what's CMP? Comprehensive metabolic panel. Okay, uh, losing weight, no. And in fact, um, she has gained some small amount of weight. Blood sample, urine sample. X-ray, um, yeah, just specific. And, and um, I apologize, guys, because this it's like three different problems kind of combined into one here. But, um, you know, rarely is it the case that you have a patient that is just one specific problem in one area. Yeah. Electrolytes, thyroid tests, liver tests. Okay. All right, so it's like an extended uh, blood work. Okay. Okay. 
right, so we'll move on here. So you can try to cram. There's a bunch that we ended up having to do, and, and you guys had some good ones that I, I hadn't even thought of. But, um, you know, we're basically getting, like, MRIs, CTs, and X-rays of, like, everything. And, um, well, I mean, maybe pelvics. I had to... Pelvic wasn't on there. There's was only lumbar, so I kind of had to write in pelvic. But yeah, probably pelvic is the right is the right one. Um. So yeah, so we did um, arthritide panel to see if this could somehow be autoimmune, and. Um, and endoscopy to look for things like, um, you know, like colitis, stuff like that. Okay, ESR and C-reactive protein, okay. Okay, those would be on an arthritide panel? Okay, that makes sense, yeah. Just testing for autoimmune in general. Okay. That's erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which um, in certain autoimmune conditions is basically you take um, somebody's, uh, you separate out the um, red blood cells and you see how fast they sediment down to the bottom. And uh, yeah, it can tell if... Uh, Person has inflammation in their system. Yeah, it's an indicator, but it's not uh, definitely not diagnostic. And and you know some of these autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, you have like eight different criteria that you have to meet four of. So that it's those things can be definitely hard to diagnose. So we'll move on here. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can be negative for rheumatoid factor and still have rheumatoid arthritis. It happens like 5% of the time. So um, the, the autoimmune things can be very, very tricky. Okay. So... Um, results of special studies, um, so we're negative for rheumatoid factor, negative for parasites, colonoscopy looks normal, um, MRI and CT show uh, endometrial implants, which um, is basically pieces of the endometrium are spreading to uh, other areas of the uterus. And it's it's uh, in multiple locations. I think like the most common is the ovaries, but for hers, it's like it's all over the place, which is um, I believe um, I can't remember the word, but uh, it's like the only disease that has this is endometriosis. pathonomic, I think. What would explain the headache? And abdominal pain? Endometriosis? Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean this so this sort of uh, gives the diagnosis away at this point. How would it cause pain after meals? You know, good question. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, great job, Nick. Yeah, I didn't want to give it away that you already got it, but uh, that was that was a very good guess back there. So as far as endometriosis, um, it's idiopathic. We don't really know what causes it. Um, yes, she did have severe bleeding as well. It's an irritable bowel mimicker. She actually got diagnosed with irritable bowel and endometriosis, but, you know, it's like one of those things like, it's a really bad condition, whatever kind of name you want to slap on it at this point. It's like, I don't know. Doesn't doesn't change the situation much. Um, so we kind of go on here and we just basically, this is what we're left with, but it's really all endometriosis and these other things are sort of sort of secondary to uh, to primary endometriosis. So, um, let's see. What are we going to do? Change of diet. Okay. Hey, by anything in particular? Okay. Get her pregnant. Okay. Surgical removal, okay. That's always an option. If it's not working, cut it out. Hysterectomy, yeah. Fiber. More fiber in the diet, is that what you're saying? Okay. Stop the birth control. Okay. And she was put on it to, to try to make it better, but maybe it's making it worse. Okay, look at possibly a new birth control prescription, hormonal assay. Okay. Pregnancy. Okay. So it's true, but that can't help. Okay. Okay. So we'll get into um, just what was done initially here. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's temporary or, or um, but. Uh, so patient did make some dietary changes, removing the the, the offending foods, and that definitely lessened um, the IBS symptoms. And she received some uh, medications for the uh, menstrual symptoms, which ended up just making them worse. And so um, hasn't really had a um, much luck with uh, traditional route. Gluten free diet. Definitely a good idea. Are there dietary an endometriosis specific diet? Um, I don't know of such an animal. Um, acupuncture, she I don't have that in here. She said she tried that. It reduced some pain temporarily, but it didn't um, didn't really do anything for a chronic condition. So it was sort of not relevant enough to it. We already got a lot in here. Okay. <sighs> Reduction of weight, fast estrogenic, exercise, and anti-inflammatory foods. Okay. Did she do an allergy screen? 
Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Um, it was just sort of she kind of noticed what foods aggravated it and tried to um, tried to cut those out of the diet. Okay, regular adjustments, yep. Yeah. Adjustment and massage could help with the mental side, acting as a behavioral treatment. So um, we'll go into what we did. If you were in Grand Rounds last term, this will be familiar, but this is my favorite uh, healing modality. Um, so patient uh, elected to do a medically supervised water-only fast. And what this is, is she went to a facility that was specifically a fasting retreat facility where she was um, put on a complete fast, fed only purified water and um, for, for 25 days. Now, this is something where they have doctors that have been doing this a long time and based on your symptoms and how the fast progress, they kind of do it day to day to gauge how long the fast will be. So she is not eating any food for uh, 25 days, drinking only water and basically doing no exercise, resting, sleeping as much as her body uh, can and wants to. And the idea is that this is like pressing the reset button on the Nintendo, that the body just completely flushes everything out and heals itself. And whatever is causing the endometriosis, we don't really know, it's getting rid of that. Is she obese? No. She's like has a few extra pounds, but is definitely not, this is not to lose weight. Like that will be a side effect of not eating, but this is not to, um, to, to as a weight loss modality. This is a healing modality. This is, I mean, dates back tens of thousands of years. In the Bible, people fasted. This was, you know, animals in nature, they don't have NSAIDs. If they are sick, they lie down and they wait it out. And that's basically what's going on here. So, she is slowly introduced to food over a 12 to 13 day period and uh, refed on a very specific diet. We have uh, whole, fresh, ripe, raw, mostly organic fruits and vegetables. So, um, you know, if it grows out of the ground, she's eating it. If it has to be altered in any way, if it's meat, fish, dairy, fowl, eggs, anything like that, pasta, bread, you know, frappuccino, al pacino, anything like that. No pills, powders, potions, just fruits and vegetables. So um, is major weight loss. So this is not starvation. This is a fast. And they are we are monitoring her to make sure that she never goes into starvation mode. So some weight loss will occur, but um, people have fasted for up to, um, I don't know, I've heard several, like, Someone said the longest on record is like 18 weeks, but most people for these major conditions can resolve them in you know, four weeks, 25 to 30 days. So, um, let's see, natural history for this condition. So after third day, so she goes through pain and... Uh, Symptoms wax and wane throughout the fast. It, at some points, they're getting you know so bad that she is just lying in bed, curled up all day. And then, um, but on third day of refeeding, and she's always been already been reintroduced to food. She, someone asks her, "How are your symptoms today?" And she realizes she has no headache, no endometrial pain, no uh, bowel pain, anything like that. And um, since then, she's been uh, p pain free and uh, symptom free of. Uh, all disease conditions. What markers signify starvation mode? You know what? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, but they are looking at, you know, they're doing blood work once a week. They're, they're, um, they're uh, monitoring all vitals twice a day. They have people checking on them and basically supervising them at all times. This is not something you can do um, Uh, on your own, definitely not. Some, it's definitely something you need to do supervised. 
Uh, what do I think? I think that um, that's that's a good question. If she skipped the water fast and went straight to the uh, the uh, the diet, um, it's possible that that this could have um, ameliorated itself. Um, but the thing is, with a diet like that, it can it's it can be tough to stick to, and the the, the fast also allows you to reset the palate so that these foods, like after, what I've been told, is that like you fast for 25 days and you eat a slice of watermelon and it's like the best thing in the world. And so all the food just tastes amazing after you've gone through this cleanse and it's much easier to stick through the diet. And there is, there's a certain level of work that your body can do when it's not having to process any food that it can't do when it's eating, even if it's very clean food. So, um, there's just, just the act of digesting your food takes up a tremendous amount of energy and just constantly having to run peristalsis and things like that. Yes, it's, um, yeah, it's harder, it may not get results and it's, it's harder to get compliance, sure. So um, she continues to follow the diet. I mean, after going through this, she does not want to be back in that position uh, anymore, and it's been two years now. The fast began January 1st, 2013. She's a good friend of mine, and she no longer has um, any, I mean, I don't know if you want to say that the disease was cured. I think that's, um, that's, we have to be careful how we use language like that, but, I mean, if she goes back to her old lifestyle, it's perfectly possible that everything could, could come back. Yeah, I see her binge on pizza and see if it came back. And uh, after all, after everything she did, I don't think uh, she's willing to to try that. <laughs> but yeah, not not a desirable situation. So she's now a vegan. Yes. Hormone therapy? No, um, she didn't want to do that. No, she is, she has not, and since then she has not, um, she told me that one time um, she went to a restaurant and got a meal that she thought would be okay and it ended up having garlic in it and she had a headache for a day and a half. So she can't even eat anything that's like, that's like uh, stimulating as far as like spices and things like that. So yeah, after two years, she's still on the same diet, and no more bleeding, no more pain, no symptom, no all the previous symptoms have completely gone away. How why was salmonella a factor? Good question. Don't really know the etiology of these autoimmune conditions is is a mystery for the most part. We know that, like you know, some things like rheumatic fever happen after, um, you know, getting uh, I can't remember what bacteria it is. I better learn that for boards because that's coming up. <laughs> yes, bacteria and virus, like you get, there are triggers for uh, inflammatory diseases. Like you get it, you get the the infection, the infection resolves, but for whatever reason, your body's still producing antibodies that are like somehow attacking your own cells. Did she think adjustments help at all? Um, sorry to disappoint, guys, but chiropractic adjustments just aren't even in the picture here. Although the doctor who supervised the fast was a chiropractor. I, um, I don't believe that uh, he adjusted her. Menstrual cycle back to normal, yes. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> History of HPV, no. Uh, has she had a follow-up appointment? I 
Not to my knowledge. Maybe. I, you know what? I don't know. I think she has told a few of her previous doctors that, um, that you know, I did this fast and my, my disease is gone. And, you know, some wanted to hear about it, some didn't. Is the treatment plan for two different conditions? Mm, the treatment is for almost any internal condition. It's basically that, you know, if you believe in the concept of, you know, innate intelligence that the body has the, the uh, ability to heal itself as long as you provide the substance, forces, and influences and conditions needed for it to do so. Thanks. Oh, okay. So yeah, my last slide. If you want to learn more about this healing modality, check out these websites, naturalhygienesociety.org, healthpromoting.com, food and sport, the word food, the letter N, the word sport.com. Oh, okay. Yeah, I made some text on this. Okay. <clears throat> so another good case, Ben. Thank you. You always bring interesting ones. Way to uh, set the bar. It's there for everyone. So water fasting. Water fasting can be kind of controversial. Um, you know, there's always been controversy over fasting, whether, you know, you're into it or not into it. Everything from juice fasting to water fasting to just plain old fasting. I mean, there's all um, different theories about how and why it works, whether it does or doesn't work. There's a reasonable amount of research out there on it, uh, both good and bad. So I suggest you uh, go out and look in the literature. Um, it's important for you to draw your own conclusions about this sort of thing. I have, um, you know, no strong opinions one way or another for water fasting in general. And I have seen really great results with people doing fasting type diets, however. So um, a bit less extreme and yet still got relatively good results, just slower. That's why I asked the question, Ben. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, there's, you know, it's, it's well known that a person who goes on a diet those first few weeks are really hard for them. One, they have bad habits. Two, uh, their taste buds are accustomed to these very overpowering kind of foods. Uh, salt in particular is at issue, salt and sugar. So when you take a person off of salt for a long period of time, when they do uh, get come across a food with any salt of substance in it at all, it, it, it's actually disgusting for them. It's just too much if you remove salt from your diet. Um, Part of that happens, I discover that partly by accident. <laughs> um, patients, the first thing I do, you know, a lot of people aren't willing to, willing to or able to go through this kind of fasting. So for by and large, most of your patients are going to try just short of, you know, this kind of fasting. Because it's quite a commitment. Um, so, you know, when you give them things like you say, you know, what are we going to change for your diet? And you want to hit the thing that's the most extreme first. One of the fastest and easiest ways is to get all processed foods out of their diet. If you do that, most people are going to be now avoiding the bulk of the salt that was in their diet. Um, and by processed foods, I mean even, you know, no restaurant, you know, nothing for a period of time. They produce everything themselves, um, everything from whole ingredients, okay, because that way you can avoid anything, pro you know, all processed. You take that out of the diet for a long enough period of time, sure. their taste buds will reset. It just takes longer, much longer. You know, here this is a really faster reset of the body. Okay, so this could take a much longer period of time. Um, this, this I have up here for you. Hang on a second. Um, information that I pulled from a site. 
just take a look at it if you're interested. Um, you know, the, the, this inflammation, you know, you know, these inflammatory mediators, they wreak havoc in the body. And we're discovering now, and this is something that people have been screaming about for a long time, is that most of these diseases are inflammatory in nature. Whether they're autoimmune in nature is a whole other different thing as well. But diabetes, heart disease, uh, atherosclerosis, uh, hypertension, what are some others? Um, multiple sclerosis, most of the, you know, uh, inflammatory arthritis, all of those. They're inflammatory in nature. They have some form of autoimmune com component. And once the inflammation kicks in, now we have prostaglandins and tumor necrosis factor and interleukins and cytokines. Now these affect all the tissues in your body when you're flooded with these all the time. The idea for treatment, whichever model you go with, has to be in interrupting this cycle. It's not an easy thing to interrupt. NSAIDs will interrupt it for a short period of time. Uh, steroidal anti-inflammatories will interrupt it for a period of time. Sometimes it's enough to stop it, put the person into remission. More often than not, it it's delays the relapse. Okay, so they go into remission for a short period of time and they relapse, and that's because in the interim, they are still eating Big Macs. Not to necessarily pick on Big Macs, pick your favorite fast food and plug it in there. So all of that's just bad. So when you're looking at working with any of these folks, adjust them certainly for symptomatic relief. Um, if there's a neurologic component, you might have more effect than you realize. Um, but they need significant, significant uh, changes in diet and lifestyle. Now I've had a few people who I worked with, uh, got them on really whole foods diets, got them on anti-inflammatory kind of diet, uh, really doing well. They're feeling much, much better. We just couldn't really kick it. We start looking at environmental issues. So you might do all of the clean diet in the world. You eat perfectly, but you live in a house that has black mold. You live in a house that has lead. You live in a house that has benzene. You live in a house. You, you work at a location that has some other chemical. You're exposed to these things. You all live out in the L.A. basin. There are more Superfund. Do you know what a Superfund site is? For those of you who had me, I think, before you may have heard me talk about Superfund sites. Superfund sites are locations that are so filthy and dirty that even the federal government has said you have to, to the companies, you have to clean that mess up. Okay, so if you go online and type in Superfund, fund with a D, you look, type that in there and look up. And it'll show you where all these locations are. I had a... I have to see if I can find, Ben, you'll love this page. I have to see if I can find this. It's a it's a link to a database and you punch in where you've lived and it gives you an environmental toxic load number based on the number of water and air and ground pollutants that you're exposed to in those areas for the period of time that you've lived there and the time period you lived there. For instance, living in LA was much more toxic 40 years ago than it is today, or 30 years ago even. Yeah, so you guys will like that one. Um, I'll also send you the link of this TED talk that I watched. I don't know if you ever watched TED. Um, of this guy who was diagnosed, a doctor, diagnosed as with a heart attack. at like 40 years old or something. And what he, what he realized is even though he was real healthy and his blood panels and everything was showing up just fine, um, he had lived near a rubber production plant across the river from where he lived for the bulk of his lifetime. And, and it, he had a massive heart attack. I couldn't figure out why. And then he started taking uh, environmental histories on his patients and realized he did this map that shows uh, locations for inflammatory diseases, cancers, and heart disease based on this toxic environment kind of model. So that's environmental medicine, which is, you know, part and parcel of this kind of therapy. All right. Environmental medicine, environmental medicine functional medicine, these, can, these guys all kind of tie together yeah. No, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, so, you know, Jessica, it's, you know, scary, yeah, but more, you know, know it so you can control it. You know, when you're looking to buy, you know, your first house or next house or next apartment or whatever, don't live next to the highway, freeway. You know, you just don't do that. Don't live next to, you know, I lived in Long Beach and I <laughs> realized after a while that probably not the best place in the world to live. You walk outside and you can smell the gas from the off-gassing from all of the propane production that they did in the area. That can't be good for you, I'm sorry, there's just no way. 
Yeah, seriously, it's like the equivalent, I forget what I looked it up at one point, living in Los Angeles is like the equivalent of a half a pack a day of cigarettes. Some, some equivalent like that. Somebody ran the numbers for that. Yeah, weird, right? Um, you know, and you, so this is really important stuff. And how often do you ask your patients to come in to see you? You know, did anybody ask this person, have you lived around an uh, agricultural area for any period of time in your life? How about people that have estrogenic type breast cancer? Have you ever lived around an agricultural area? Most of Orange County is built on agricultural area. The incidence of breast cancer in Orange County is higher than it is in a majority of other places. You know, all of those pesticides are estrogenic. They stay in the soil for a long period of time. So you're worried about somebody eating an organic vegetable when where they live is giving them more pesticide than they'll ever get from their food in their total lifetime. I know we're running a little over, but I have a little bit more soapbox and then I'll quit. So then you have another issue with you talk about this is related to this. What do we do for diet for a person? Let's say they're, you know, in this situation, water fast or not, afterward. Um, some people aren't willing to stick with that diet. I know it sounds crazy that they would do it and get better and then go off the diet, but they do. But you're going to have your average person ask you this question. I want to start eating organic. What do you recommend I go with? Would your answers be fruits and vegetables? Mine is if you're going to go organic and you're not going to go vegan, dairy products, meat. If you're going to continue to eat either of those two things, if you pick something to go put your organic dollars toward, you want those, and that's because they're the the you know the concentration of pesticide and everything else in that animal is going to be higher than it is going to be in you know the broccoli, with the exception of what's like the dirty dozen, you know peaches, anything fuzzy, berries, uh, stuff like that. Think about it a minute. If you had a cow eating grass, they eat pounds and pounds and pounds of the stuff to make milk. And you're going to drink that milk? Milk is a great way for the body to get rid of toxins. It's fat-soluble. Stuff can get out in the body that way. And that's why, you know, you get a cow that's drinking, eating organic grass instead of eating, you know, GMO soybeans and pesticide-laden grasses. You're going to have a lot better, you're going to have a lot better response with that. So you want to go to that direction. Yeah, you go, you go a little bit. Yeah, you guys go to lunch if you want to go to lunch. I'll stick around and, and keep going for those of you who want to continue the conversation. So, you know, go a little bit at a time, but you have to pick something. So, you know, you're not going to get a person to go from eating fast food every day to jumping into organic food. It's just not going to happen. What you need to do is first say, let's, let's cook at home for the first couple of weeks. Can we do that? No more eating out. Um, let's start with that. And no processed food. If it comes out of a box, you're not allowed to have it. You know, there's a big suggestion here, all this gluten-free, gluten-free, it's nice, okay, but most people aren't actually gluten intolerant. Um, I have a strong suspicion what we're going to find is the problem with grain products happens to be the pesticides and genetic modification, right? Yeah, sorry. It's, I get going on, this is a big thing for me, this, this whole stuff. Especially, you know, some of you know about my uh, background and my health condition. So, you know, this is stuff is near and dear to me. For those of you who don't know, I don't want to ruin it. I'll, I'll present a case of myself here at some point. Yeah. But it's true, you know. Yeah, pollution is really bad. Drugs, all of it. It's all bad. It's all bad. But, you, you know, you're going to have patients. You've got to make a change with them. You're not going to make giant changes. They're not going to be compliant, not for any period of time. I mean, you know how hard it is for a person to lose 10 pounds, let alone to make these kind of dramatic changes to their diet and lifestyle. People can nearly die from a disease and still not be willing to make changes. I've had people diagnosed with lung cancer leave their hospital beds to smoke cigarettes. You need to think, no, there's no way, right? If that was me, there's no way. But I guarantee you, yeah, bad habits, I mean, and they're hard to break. This is just the way people are. And you're not going to harangue them out of it. You have to learn to work within it. it you all are in the glowing phase of, I'm going to save everybody. But, you know, the dose of reality is that most people, you, you can't save them despite themselves. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can't speak to the water. I can't speak to the water fasting, Muhammad. I don't have that expertise. Um, the way I do things slightly different, you know, because I don't do the water fasting and I think it's dramatic. I, I think there's certainly people where it's effective. I mean, the research has been shown. Um, there are also pretty big dangers that go along with it. That's why it's medically supervised. For me, that's not the direction I want to go in. Yeah, and that's not a problem. I mean, it's going to help the people and it helps great. In the interim, what you can do is you whole food diet a person. It takes longer and they won't get that same kind of reset that you get with the water fasting. But you can go to these very gentle whole foods diets. Now, I was a raw vegan for six years, so speaking from some experience, that is a challenging diet. It's not for lack of flavor. The foods taste fantastic. It's hard on the teeth. It's hard on the gut. Uh, it's raw foods. I mean, it's tough for a while there. You know? Um, once you get going on it, though, it gets to be quite, gets quite easy. You know, it takes a little while to adapt, you know? Um, you know, that's where juices come in and some of those, because you can supplement some of their nutritional needs with juices. you got to watch the juices, though. They are, in effect, a processed food. You have concentration of sugars, you have concentration of all that, you have a lack of fibers. So juices are nice, but you could get, yeah. It's hard. So you'll find that not everybody's going to respond the same way. You know, you're going to have some people that, you know, need different kinds of diets. You have to keep your eyes open and your minds open and everything else. Um, I know you guys are pushing it up against lunchtime, so if you have to go, it's cool. You, know, you, you will find these challenging. So Ben, I always really appreciate your uh, perspective on these because I know you're heavy into the water fasting thing. You know, um, I've read the articles. I know they're um, here. Hang on, that's uh, am I wanting to say? Who did I read? It was uh, Goldhammer. Is I'm saying that right? Goldhammer. I've done some of the research in that. Yeah. So. You know, it's interesting, um, and you don't see a lot on the risks. I've researched, I've looked, you know, to see, um, but, you know, you are going to run into some potential problems with, do they monitor the blood for calcium levels and potassium levels? Those would be the two things I would be really concerned about. Yeah, Ryan, it's great, the stuff that's available out there now. Yeah, you have to keep doing the blood work. The thing that's yes, you can get really sketchy with potassium and calcium is those can flip on you in hours, not just, you know, days. Like you can have a potassium flip really fast depending on what the person's doing. You know, like I realize they're supposed to be taking it easy, but if they should all of a sudden, you know, get up and run around, they, they could really, um, their potassium levels could plummet and stop their heart. Th those are kind of the big risks. Yeah, isn't that weird? It's because the body's pulling it all out of the different, you know, areas of the body. Your hormones go a little wacky, all that kind of thing. It, it's kind of uh, wild what happens with fasting. Um, so like I said, I've seen, you know, short day fasting, which has been shown to really be helpful, in, particularly in diabetics. Um, you know, and they're doing these little three-day, these little three-day water fasts, which, you know, it's... it's a lot for some people, but not too bad. You know, three days pretty manageable. Um, I've seen people do the uh, light juice fasting. You know, it's mostly water. There's just enough calories to kind of keep you from uh, having brain function issues. There are a lot of different ways. Yeah, no problem. I realize, again, you guys don't have to, some of you, you don't have to stick around if you want lunch. I just figured I'd hang out. This is a subject I find real interesting. How many patients has he done now, Ben? I mean, his, most of his articles looks like about 200 that I've seen just in articles that he's reported on, result-wise. Yeah. I'm getting curious. You know, I, what I'm curious to find, and what I, what I can't find, seem to find, are tens of thousands. Yeah, but he doesn't, uh, he hasn't published all that many. The articles I could find, I think it was about 200 or 300 were. And the one, no offense to Dr. Goldhammer, I'll, I'll have to take a look and uh, see if I'm accurate about this, but the one looked with a little salami, like it was a subset of another data set, but that's a whole different different things, yeah. 
you know, when you collect that much data on that many people, you're going to have a lot of things to talk about. I'd be curious to see an article on the risks and failures of the water fasting. So what I think a failure of a lot of researchers is that they only want to put out the positive stuff, and they don't put out the negative. And we don't, when you don't publish the negative results, it doesn't give a person, you know, a practitioner, another practitioner, a reasonable way to assess risk to benefit. You know, oh, I'm not suggesting death. I'm just saying, you know, there's got to be some side effect. You know, and what if this were taken on by a larger number of people or larger groups of people, you're you're likely to start seeing deaths because, you know, he's got a very vested interest in his thing, believes in it very wholeheartedly, it's all he does. We have um, kind of dabbling practitioners start doing this sort of thing, we're going to run into trouble. Those are kind of my concerns. And I don't see any, you know, good solid research to show what you would be on the lookout for. That's all. It kind of makes me wonder. It is nice to know that one is not. Yeah, I mean, the human body can go for a long time on water. Yeah. The recommendation to go beyond two weeks, though, is kind of <laughs> risky. Right up to about there. That's why I say like three days, you're, you're really safe. Yeah, you know, those are nice, but they don't they don't help too much. All, all those do is direct somebody to do legitimate research. I'm not suggesting that they're not accurate. I'm just saying that in the greater, yeah, you know what I mean? So those are kind of the things you do and say, huh, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder, let's do a real, you know, a clinical trial on this. So right now, his are all descriptive studies. They're essentially very large numbers of case reports. So if we wanted to know for sure if this worked, we would need to design a placebo-controlled trial. Now, how do you control do a placebo-controlled trial when water is the only, you know, it's impo yeah, it's impossible to do. Because everything's going to have a calorie, it's going to have a flavor. Unless you were able to make the liquid flavored in such a way that you could hide the sweet, but then you'd be introducing a foreign agent into the liquid, you know, so that... I've thought about this a bit, in case you, <laughs> you know. It's very interesting, nonetheless. It's very interesting. It does require a measure of caution, but it is very interesting. I I'm very interested, you know, personally. So that's, the, you know, another it's more than professional. kind of suspect that it might assist my condition, although last year I did somewhat of a fast and it uh, did not seem to have the desired effect, let's put it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Alright, well you guys have a good one. We'll talk to you next week.